Hello, everybody. I'm Alex, I'm with Flyleaf Books. Uh, thank you for coming out tonight and supporting your local independent bookstore as well as this wonderful author um, and Carolina Public Humanities. We really appreciate you being here and your book purchases and attendance help us all out, so appreciate it. Uh, this evening, we have the pleasure of hearing from Lloyd Kramer about his new book, Traveling to Unknown Places, along with Carolina Public Humanities Executive Director, Max Orr. Lloyd Kramer is Professor of History Emeritus and former Director of Carolina Public Humanities at UNC Chapel Hill. His research, writing, and teaching focus of European cultural history, with particular attention to modern France and the processes of transatlantic intellectual exchanges. We hope you enjoy the event. Thank you again. And remember, you can grab a copy of the book up front after the reading if you didn't already get one. And I'm sure Lloyd would sign a book if you didn't manage to snag him ahead. All right. I'll turn it over now to Lloyd Kramer. Thank you, Alex. I really appreciate uh, that introduction. I appreciate all of you being here. I appreciate Flyleaf Books, an independent bookstore here in, shout out to Flyleaf Books. I deeply appreciate Carolina Public Humanities, my friends and colleagues for a decade and more. And I appreciate all my friends who are here. And um, I, I, I can't tell you what a journey I feel like I've been on over my whole life because of the community here in Chapel Hill. And we are living through a time of upheaval and uncertainty. So I want to take us back into the past because every era, every generation has times of uncertainty. And Max and I are going to talk about this book. He has read it, so he has questions. And that's the sign of a humanistic dialogue. We're going to carry it on. But to introduce it, I want to give you a little overview of key themes. OK, here is the book and the, uh, the cover. I'm going to set it down. And um, now wait, where is the, um, here we go. So the book is called Traveling to Unknown Places, 19th Century Journeys. Um, whoops, wrong thing. There. And this book grows out of a lifelong interest in the history of cross-cultural relations and encounters with people from different cultures. I won't go through my whole intellectual agenda, but I want to note that about 12 years ago, I published a book on the history of nationalism. <clears throat> and nationalism as I approached it, was a story about how people construct identities in a whole culture, create public monuments, broad narratives, and how they define their nation in opposition to other nations. This book is about the history of personal national identities and how as individuals we incorporate and assimilate a national narrative and carry it with us wherever we go. So, traveling to unknown places, consists of four parts. There's an introduction, which lays out theories a little bit about travel, about the meaning of self, about what it means to understand travel as a historical problem. And then it has four parts. Each part consists of two uh, accounts of two people, one man and one woman. And each part, there are four French people and four Americans, OK? Two French women, two French men. The French men are Victor Jacquemont and this man, Nicolas Point, who was a Jesuit priest. Victor Jacquemont was a scientist. Flora Tristan, who was a, a French woman, an early feminist. The Americans are Margaret Fuller, a writer from Massachusetts, and Randall McGavick, uh, a politician and writer from Tennessee. An African-American woman named Nancy Prince, who was from Massachusetts, also a free woman of color. And David Dorr, who was an enslaved man from New Orleans, who traveled with his enslaver to Europe in the early 1850s. One of the only enslaved Americans to travel as a slave to Europe, where he encountered the meaning of freedom and came back, escaped from his master and eventually moved to Ohio and wrote a book called A Colored Man Around the World. And the other person is a French woman named Olympe Oduard, who was an early feminist in France and wrote about her experiences in America. So four Americans writing about Europe, 
for French people writing about the Americas, although Jacques Mont also went to Italy. So I want to just take a moment to say something about the meaning of selfhood, because what is selfhood? You all have a self, right? Did you all bring yourself with you? Of course you did. But selfhood is slightly different from identity because identity is something other people can give to you. Like, you know, you're an American, you're a woman, you're a man, you're whatever category of identity they may choose to ascribe. Selfhood is something that is constructed with more of an interior dimension, a deeper layer, which may draw, which does draw, on the identities that others give you, but it also can be something other than what other people tell you you are, right? So I, I should mention, I draw on this book by Gerald Siegel called The Idea of the Self, Thought and Experience in Western Europe Since the 17th Century. And he says, these are two very prominent selves in 19th century culture, Lord Byron and Margaret Fuller, he says it is a connection of the physical, the social, and the interior that creates selfhood. So I want to just share what he said. Three dimensions of selfhood. We'll call them the bodily or material, because everybody has a body. The relational, everybody has social relationships, families, friends, so forth. And the reflective dimensions of the self. The first involves the physical, corporeal existence of individuals. On this level, our cells are housed in our bodies and shaped by the body's needs. And when you travel, you always take your body with you. You've known, you know that experience, right? <laughs> Secondly, the second layer of selfhood is the relational dimension that arises from social and cultural interaction, the connections, involvements with other people. In this perspective, our selves are what our relations with society and with others shape or allow us to be. All of us are embedded in a social world a family, a community. And the third dimension, that of reflectivity, derives from the human capacity to make both the world and our own existence objects of our active regard, to turn a kind of mirror not only on phenomena in the world, including our own bodies and social relations, but on our consciousness too, putting ourselves at a distance from our own being so as to examine, judge, and sometimes regulate or revise it. And what I want to argue is that travel affects all these layers of selfhood. You know this when you travel. It's a physical experience, a social experience, a reflective experience. Okay. Let me just say one more thing about the origins of the book. The book stresses three interconnected contexts. You know, uh, intellectual historians, which I am, always talk about the relation between the context and the ideas that emerge from that context. So there were a particular historical context after the French and American revolutions that influenced travel. There was the emergence of nationalism, and this book talks a lot about that new identity after the revolutions. The idea of progress how you could judge countries and cultures by how far along they had moved on the course of progress, economic progress, industrial progress, scientific progress. And this, of course, justified uh, displacement of Native Americans, for example. They were less advanced for Europeans. Debates about systems of enslavement in this period, 1820s, 1850s, and 60s, slavery was everywhere. Everyone who traveled wrote about it, discussed it, compared social rights and human rights in each culture. And the other element, descriptions of women's rights, the contradictions of gender hierarchies and abusive marriage systems. The two French women who traveled, for example, were both in abusive marriages, but divorce was illegal in France from 1816 to 1884. So if your relationship was not going well, what could you do? Leave the country. You know, if you could figure out a way to do it. The second context is the more theoretical context. I was very influenced by various theories about the influence of language and symbols in every traveler's interpretation of reality. This is called sort of semiotic theory, but I won't go into all that. 
Second, the influence of gender and racial identities in every traveler's experiences, because you can never go anywhere without people noticing your gender, your race. And third, the influence of internal psychological desires and fears in every traveler's response to other cultures. We have another, the other, also within the self. And the question is, how do we mediate between the other that is out there and the other that is within the self? And that's the psychological component. This, by the way, is a, a, a painting of some Peruvian women wearing the saya and manto in the 1840s um, by a Peruvian, African Peruvian artist. Flora Tristan went to Peru, and she writes a, a lot about this phenomenon. Finally, the third context, my own personal experiential context. In 1973, shortly after uh, Richard Nixon defeated George McGovern, does anyone in the room remember that election? Oh, we have a lot of older people here. I was devastated. I was living in Massachusetts at the time. I had been canvassing. I thought things were looking pretty good. As it turned out, that was the only state McGovern carried. I mention this because so many people today are feeling overwhelmed, especially in Chapel Hill. They're feeling despair, uncertainty. So my wife at that time and myself, <laughs> we decided we didn't really fit in. We had to travel. We had to go somewhere else. So we got jobs in Hong Kong. We lived in Hong Kong for a couple of years teaching in a school. And every day I had to mediate the problem of cultural di difference. Chinese food, Chinese language, different religious traditions. And then at the end of that, we took a journey all the way across Asia, overland from Southeast Asia all the way to Paris. And then I lived a number of years in, in France. These experiential things altered the way I understood myself because I had grown up in Benton, Arkansas, Evansville, Indiana, and Maryville, Tennessee, and 100% American culture. But I was never the same again. So, you know when people do a book talk, they usually read something, right? From the book. I'm going to read two passages, okay? This is to save you the trouble of reading the whole book. I'm giving you a head start. As the book is a bit long, this is from the introduction. Everyone in the modern world travels to unknown places. You understand this experience from your own life because you have gone to new schools, visited previously unfamiliar cities, moved to take new jobs, met family members in distant towns, spent holidays in beautiful natural environments or crossed borders into foreign countries. I want to stress, by the way, I use the word you quite a bit because I see the book as a dialogue between myself and the reader. Sort of like in my classes at UNC, I always wanted to have a dialogue with the people in the class, or at a humanities seminar, always a dialogue. To me, the relation between an author and the reader is dialogical. So you understand this experience. Travel is therefore one of the most common experiences of modern life, but like every aspect of human culture, it has a long history and changes over time. Nothing stays the same. This book examines the meaning of travel in the life histories of 19th century French and American writers, and it draws on their specific experiences to argue more generally that long journeys have often influenced modern ideas about individual selfhood and national cultures. Travel leads people into disorienting social and cultural encounters that reshape personal and collective identities. New interactions with unfamiliar people, customs, and languages force travelers to become more aware of the ways in which their home culture has deeply influenced their self-understanding and their differences from people in other parts of the world. Voyages into unknown places and languages typically generate anxieties, fears, and frustrations, as well as unexpected insights, creative tensions, and personal transformations. That's what this book explores over eight chapters of eight different individuals in the 19th century. And then finally, from the preface, travel was, of course, only one of the identity-shaping experiences of the 19th century or of any other century. 
but it offers a microcosm of how nationalism and cross-cultural encounters have continually influenced the creation and meaning of modern selfhood. In most general terms, this book argues that traveling to previously unknown places in other cultures also carries you to previously unknown places within yourself. This is the thesis of the book. It's a double entendre. Excuse my French. It, it, traveling to unknown places is both out there and in here. From the last paragraph, now just skip everything in all of those chapters. As you read these concluding paragraphs, because here I'm making a general argument that travel is not going to disappear. Ambitious future travelers are sitting somewhere in noisy cafes or working in windowless offices or daydreaming in dull classrooms or mourning broken relationships in lonely apartments or, I should add, weeping about lost elections. They may be looking at maps that suggest the next bold steps toward a different life. Many of these people will eventually find a way to leave for famous or unknown places and some may never come home again. To quote the parting words of David Dorr, the African-American enslaved man, in 1858 at the end of his book, they will take leave of their homelands with a decisive au revoir, goodbye. But their long journeys to distant places will also carry these restless travelers toward places within themselves that they had never known or understood at home. That's the thesis beginning to end, and there's a lot of stuff in between. <laughs> and Max is going to now ask us questions. And I, I won't go into the particular authors here yet, but we may talk about them. Margaret Fuller, Nancy Prince, David Doerr, Olympo Duar. Max, lead me into a dialogue. Well, let's do it. Well, first of all, let's put our hands together for Lloyd Kramer. It's just... Um, one personal note of travel, um, my own travel to North Carolina in, the, in August of uh, 2002, uh, coming to an unknown place, knowing, not knowing who we would meet, coming to be, be a graduate student here in the history program. Um, and one of the first people I met was this person over here, who has had such an incredible impact on my own creation of self uh, and all that I've learned in interactions with Lloyd Kramer all the work we've done in the history department in Carolina Public Humanities. It's been a journey, Lloyd, and I certainly feel like uh, there's a lot of you inside of me um, in terms of creating that self. So thank you personally for that. Thank you, Max. Thank you. Thank you. Always a dialogue for 20 more, yeah. more than 20 years. I hear your voice in my head at <laughs> night. I got <laughs> Not a good time. <laughs> Um, this is. So I want to start with a theoretical question, and and I do. We did talk about some of the uh, the um, people, and we. I think we're going to focus mostly on the Americans in this book to, uh, today. Um, although I would love to at some point talk about Flora Tristan and Olympe Odouard, two people that you introduced me to actually. Um, but the first question is theoretical, and it's about this notion that somehow this these two going with Gerald Siegel. By the way, a book Lloyd gave me for comps. Uh, just so you know, so it's definitely, I can see. He can't get away. I can see this intellectual tradition uh, uh, for sure. So with these three ideas, there's the physical self, the relational self, and this reflexive self. Um, in these, it seems like the self is never a stable thing. If we're always reflecting on the conditions that are around us, and of course what happens when people travel, they go to other places and they see you know, foreign things and have all sorts of new stimuli that that create new opportunities for reflection. That's certainly the key idea of the book. But is the self always just recreating itself by, by being reflexive of its conditions? Like, is everyone right here in this room having a different self right now? And how can we separate someone who has sort of made a progress to a more mm -hmm. genuine self or a self that they feel that they can describe um, and the self that just kind of is constantly being changed and, and through life? So I, I see the self kind of like other structures of history, let's say like a great building, right? The building is always there. The self may always carry the same name, although sometimes people change the name. So there are certain continuities in the self that we learn 
how to get certain things in the world, how to interact with people. But the self is different in every relationship, in every place. So the person you are, you were with your parents when you were a child is different from the person you are with your colleagues or with your friends. Or You are still a coherent self, but the self is never fully coherent because you are always in dialogical relationships with other people. And, you know, I think about this because, for example, when, when my parents died, I'm sure many of you had this experience of going to a funeral and someone tells you, oh, this is what your mother meant to me or your father. Oh, my gosh, that was a whole side of her. I didn't know. This is true for every one of us. Somebody knows something about us that even the closest people don't know. When you travel, you confront that multiplicity of selves and nobody ever has just one self. That doesn't mean you're crazy. It just means you are never just one person. And, pardon? There's no core. I think there is something that endures that gives you a way of interacting with each person around you. The question was, is there, is there no core? There is something that you recognize as your deep values, as your integrity, as your, I don't want to use the word essence, but as your enduring uh, personality. But that personality, that core, alters in relation to each person somewhat, somewhat. Always similar in some deep level, but never exactly the same. I appreciate that. The, um... It seems to me that if we are trying to define the self when we come to travelers, uh, only one of the people that, in terms of the four we're going to look at today, seem to have a place where they arrived at a sense of the self. And unfortunately, it was because she died right afterwards. Like there was a sense that Margaret Fuller, who will be our first person we'll talk about, had had unlike the other the other four that the other three that we're going to talk about, because had sort of arrived at this place in her memoirs that it felt like that self was something we could look at as the traveler self. But afterwards, if people are writing about travel 10 years after the fact, it's, not, it's no longer reflecting about the travel that they're doing. It's reflecting on the memory of the travel. You mentioned something really about traveling back in the past, yeah. like especially with someone like David Dorr writing about this considerably earlier in his life. Um, is that, does that... Uh, I guess I try well, to make this a question for you, Lloyd. As could we talk about Margaret Fuller for a second? Let's talk. Let's go to Margaret Fuller. How many of you have encountered Margaret Fuller? If you've read, a few of you know about her. Um, this is Margaret Fuller in Rome. I can read it, Lloyd, if you want. Do you want to read the passage? I will. So let, let me just say the sad thing about Margaret Fuller. She went to France and then to Italy in 1846-47, became very involved she went as a kind of literary person. She was writing for the New York Tribune of Horace Greeley. She was the first American woman journalist in Europe to write about European affairs. She got caught up in the revolutions of 1848-49. She met an Italian man. She married him. They had a child. Uh, this was a very dramatic event because she came from a Protestant family. He was Catholic. And the revolution of 1849 failed. It was a devastating defeat. She threw herself into this, heart and soul. And we, I think, who are suffering now about politics and disappointment have nothing on people who have gone through similar things in the past. And this was her last letter to America before she got on a ship to come back to America with her husband. And the ship sank off of Long Island, Fire Island, and she and her husband and two-year-old child all drowned. And she never got back to America. Age 40, she died. Within like 100 feet of the shore as she well. She couldn't swim. Yeah. And she lost her life. So... This is yeah. her last letter. So, she, uh, so in her last letter, she writes, At this moment, all the worst men are in power and the best betrayed and exiled. All the falsities, the abuses of the old political forms, the old social compacts seem confirmed. Yet it is not so. The struggle that is now to begin will be fearful, but even from the first hours, not doubtful. Bodies rotten and trembling cannot long contend with swelling life. 
tongue and hand cannot be permanently employed to keep down hearts. The struggle may last 50 years, and the earth may be watered with the blood and tears of more than one generation, but the result is sure. All Europe is to be under Republican government in the next century. See how optimistic she tried to be? So why is this story important for travel? When she left, she was a, a single woman trying to become a writer, interested in transcendentalism, friend of Ralph Waldo Emerson. She goes to Europe to study culture and literature and art. She gets caught up in the revolutionary upheavals of 1848-49. She marries a man who's involved in the revolution in Italy. She transforms from a writer who's discussing transcendentalist philosophy to a writer who is trying to make sense of the political world and interpreting for Americans what the revolutions in Europe mean and coming home with a vision of what she's going to become, a writer interpreting Europe for Americans, but she never gets home. I still feel sad every time yeah. I think about her story. And that's why I'm wondering about her, you know, would we, I guess it's a great what if, we would never know what she would be writing about in 1860 if she had been able to live and what, how, how that would have changed. Because in this particular chapter, we have a person who has had a transformation of self and then tragically is gone from the record. So the might have beens of history, what mm -hmm. would have happened to Margaret Fuller? I would say if she was still alive in 1860-61, she would have supported the Union side <laughs> in no the Civil doubt, War. No doubt, no doubt. Let me go out on a limb and say that. So, what, so Fuller came with a predisposition to seek out cultural knowledge. Um, is that different? When you have a sort of, in some ways, there are some preconditions, some prejudices she has. She had some ideas about Europe. She did a lot of research and whatnot, knew about it when she went. Um, does that impinge? I mean, if you're trying to create a genuine self, uh, does it have to be sort of aleatory, just things that come in that you respond to and that make you realize? Or does she self-create herself with her with the knowledge that she sought out this mm -hmm. predisposition to seek out cultural knowledge um, it's really an act of of agency to create a new self but does it is there a negative side to that in that in that you're not genuinely experiencing something you're kind of going in with i want to create this self from my knowledge mm. that i have so Every traveler carries a lot of baggage. You, you carry baggage when you go on a trip, right? <laughs> Literally, yeah. And that baggage includes your culture, your education, your language. You, you don't check your bag. You lose your baggage sometimes, but you don't lose it completely. And what you do in that new place is take that baggage, you, you use it to interpret what you encounter. You can't escape your baggage, your language, your education, your family. We all come from somewhere. But what is so unexpected is how that encounter causes you to, to let go of some of the baggage you've brought with you. She didn't know when she went to Europe that Europe was about to have the revolution of 1848. We know that. She didn't know that. Just like we don't know what's going to happen in our country over the next two years. But somebody will write about us a hundred years from now and they'll say, oh, we know what happened. So Fuller actually She didn't know. Fuller actually says, um, this is you quote her here, my mind and character are much too formed. I shall not modify them much, but only add to my stores of knowledge. She wrote that to a friend shortly before she left. And it shows how naive she was because she thought, well, I'm just going to learn more about what I already know. Mm -hmm. What she didn't understand was that she was going to encounter a whole set of people, conflicts that she knew nothing about. It's interesting. That's naivete. We all think, oh, I don't think I can change much now. I'm 40 years. She was 36 when she wrote that, 36 years old. You know, it's interesting. She marries this uh, Italian, uh, Osoli, and uh, and, Osoli. and you know, and one of the things that uh, this is uh, said, uh, he is very unlike most Italians, but very unlike most Americans too. Seems like she was attracted to a person who didn't embody the Italian, the essence of being Italian or the essence of being American. Any idea why that would have been attractive to her? 
So I wish I knew more about the dynamics of their relationship. Yeah. You know, relationships are hard to understand. I think he fascinated her because he came from a strong Catholic family and he had moved away from that to embrace the revolution, which mm -hmm. was more secular, like Mazzini, who was the leader of the Italian revolution. Um, she felt he was so different from the men she knew in America that that made him interesting and attractive. So I, I wouldn't want to put too much stress on that relationship as the decisive effect in her transformation. But you can't separate the personal from the cultural and the political. I mean, I, my speculation is that by choosing someone who seemed not to sort of be in between cultures herself, provided a great opportunity for this self-creation that was continuing to go on, you know, this self-exploration. Right. And he, because he had joined the revolution and left the Catholic Church, he was also in an ambiguous social position and rejected by his family. Yep. So that's an interesting point. Um, but he had never been outside of Italy. Yeah. And, you know, one of the things we mentioned is that Fuller became more European and the, the other American who you grouped these so nicely in, in groups of two, the other McGavick became more American. I hate to turn to McGavick, but I'm going to because he's the person in this book that I did not like. <laughs> <laughs> we all have certain people we meet um, that we don't like that much. Uh, it, interesting person, for sure. And I'm not going to judge. I mean, of course, we, 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 we're not going to judge by the circumstances of him being um, an enslaver and right now in, in terms of being able to get interesting comments on, on traveling and how it made him understood as American. But Fuller said that there were three types of travelers, right? Um, and uh, or three types of American travelers, right? And uh, the first one was the, I, oh, the name is, it's the, essentially someone who's ignorant, who's just seeking out the fashions, seeking mm -hmm. out the, the good food, the good, you know, just, and, and very sort of selfish. The second category she called the conceited American. Mm -hmm. And the conceited American seems very much to be McGavick. This is someone who thinks it's much better in America. Have yep. you ever been on a travel group with someone who no matter what happened, they said the food here isn't very good, the hotel isn't right, the people aren't very friendly, it's better in America. You know that, guy? yeah, maybe you've, been, maybe you've been that person on the trip. Um, I'm not singling anyone out. Let, let me just comment on that. There are two very interesting contrasts in the way people travel. Some people, as we say, go native. They love the other culture. They use that culture to free themselves from home. Other people become far more nationalistic. They say everything at home is better. I can't wait to get back to America. It's the best place in the world. So do you th that's, that's there. And both of those travelers represent those, uh, those poles. Well, I got the sense from McGavick, especially you, you mentioned how uh, when McGavick was comparing European poverty with American slavery, and of course, uh, praising the latter as being a more humane system than European poverty, which is a really challenging. Uh, you, you basically said that his arguments were all sort of prepackaged talking points. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm wondering, so what did the travel do for McGavick if he had already had these talking points? Mm -hmm. So Randall McGavick was from Nashville, Tennessee. I'm, I lived in Tennessee for many years. McGavick was a Presbyterian. I was raised as a Presbyterian. I was fascinated by this man, and the more I got to know him, the less I liked him. <laughs> I'm glad we have to share something. <laughs> but historians have to engage with people mm -hmm. with whom they disagree. If we only wrote about people who are exactly like ourselves, which some people want to do, how would you ever enter into a dialogue with anyone except yourself? So McGavick is a strange character. He became increasingly American. He argued for the value of the American unity. Ironically, he came back to America, and during the Civil War, he joined the Confederate Army commanded a regiment of troops from Tennessee and was killed in battle in 1863 near Vicksburg, dying in a war against the country that during his writings yeah. about Europe, he said, I love America. America is the greatest country. We should never apologize. And he died on a battlefield fighting against the government of the American states. So 
Did the travel change him? I think it did. I could go into details. He became a somewhat alienated from his Presbyterianism. He became somewhat more critical of his home country, he, uh, home city. He actually wanted to go back to Europe afterwards and be a diplomat. None of that worked out. But in the end, why is he interesting? He is an example of how, for some people, travel ultimately makes them more, identify more with their country mm -hmm. rather than reject their country. And both sides of this have to be recognized. Yeah. It can make you more American, not less American, or more French, not less French. And depending on, and, and that doesn't necessarily have to be negative or positive in terms of one's own, about the sort of virtues of being more American or more European. In McGavick's case, he had some opinions that I think in con contemporary standards we don't appreciate. <laughs> uh, th there was a lot of racism in all of these characters. This is one of the things that's most striking if you really engage the letters and writings of 19th century authors from France or the United States. Not the black authors, but the white authors. Racism is everywhere. Yeah. It's just baked in. So one thing about one thing I thought was interesting too the difference between Fuller and, and McGavick and also a little bit with Prince especially Prince who had such a long stay in Russia um, I'm thinking about McGavick is such an itinerant traveler he's traveling all over the place Margaret Fuller settles down in some area mm -hmm. um, what happens I mean can you speak a little bit to this process of selfhood and the difference between just sort of flitting from one place to mm -hmm. the other um, and maybe that maybe that emphasizes the Americanness. If McGavick had stayed put in one place, would he have been more reflective and appreciated other cultures? Can you speak a little bit about duration of travel and its effect on this? So, I put up this other. This is not Nancy Prince. Nancy Prince was a black woman from Massachusetts. There are no pictures of Nancy Prince. This alone tells you there is no recorded death date or birth date for Nancy Prince. There is one book about the travels of Nan that she wrote. She lived in Russia for seven year, almost seven years. She went there because her husband was in the black guard of the Tsar Alexander of Russia. Did you know that the Russian Tsars had a, a guard unit of all black men, tall men, who were recruited from various places. There were a number of Americans. And Nancy Prince married this guy, Nero Prince, who was a sailor. She met him in Massachusetts. She went to um, Russia. And she had never been respected anywhere. This is a second example of how travel alters your life. And for the first time in her life, she had an Aretha Franklin experience. <laughs> R-E-S-P-E-C-T. Give it to me, give it to me. R-E-S-P-E-C-T. She had never been respected. And she describes going into the palace of the Tsar of Russia and being greet greeted by the Tsar and the Tsarina who bow down to her and welcome her when she couldn't even get a ride on a stagecoach out of Boston. Do you have a quote there? I do. On, I have this quote. On entering the palace, the usual salutation by the guards was performed. As we passed through the beautiful hall, a door was opened by two colored men in official dress. The Emperor Alexander stood on his throne in his royal apparel. The throne is circular, elevated two steps from the floor, and covered with scarlet velvet tasseled with gold. As I entered, the Emperor stepped forward with great politeness and welcomed me and asked several questions. He then accompanied us to the Empress Elizabeth. She stood in her dignity and received me in the same manner the Emperor had. They presented me with a watch, etc. It was customary in those days when anyone married belonged to the court to present them with gifts. There was no prejudice against color. There were people of all nations, each in their place. So, this is a very important part of the book because it shows how an African-American woman who was totally disregarded suddenly in America finds herself at the palace of the Tsar of Russia welcomed by the most powerful man of Russia. This would probably affect anyone. But imagine this transformative experience. And then she writes a book about that. This is what happened to me. And later, she went back to Boston. Her husband died. She went back to Boston. And then she went to Jamaica shortly after the enslaved 
black people of Jamaica were liberated. And so then she wrote about how important she was in interpreting the lives of formerly enslaved people to abolitionists in America. So why is travel important? In the first case, it transforms a woman's political and literary identity and her personal life. The second, it gives a woman a new respect and mission in the world that she never had before. Impossible in the United States in 1840, 1820. One of the things I like that you wrote about this, Lloyd, and on, uh, you mentioned that she places herself in all of her accounts in a way that the other writers don't do. The other writers sort of describe what they see, but she uh, sort of places herself as a character in those accounts. Any, any reason why that makes this distinctive from the others? Because she wasn't trying to be the same kind of travel writer as other writers who, who like to describe, well, these are the famous historic sites. These are the places you need to go to see Notre Dame. This is where you need. There was a, a genre of travel writing. And she just said, I'm here. This is who I am. David Doerr was similar, the other uh, African-American writer. You don't need to hear stories about places I've seen. I want you to know about my experience as a free person. And that's what she conveyed in a very kind of dreamlike narrative. She had learned to read and write from, she worked as a domestic in a Massachusetts home and she learned how to read and write. She never went to beyond a couple of years of school. He was already there. He, he was a sailor. There were a lot of black sailors in the early 19th century America. He went to Europe and somehow he met somebody at a port city in Europe who was recruiting exceptional tall black men to be in the czar's you know, regiment. guard. And then he went back, he got the job, then he went back and married Nancy and then she became Nancy Prince, and, and that's how they got there. It's a long shot, I, I grant you. How many people have that story? But it changed her life. So she married an African-American man and went to Russia. Margaret Fuller um, married an Italian during the Italian Revolution. None of this could have been expected in their youth. This gives all of us hope. You never know what's coming next. Have you noticed that about your life? If you think you've got it figured out, forget it. Something else happens. And a journey always throws something in your direction that you never thought would happen. That's like, the moral of the story, I traveling to, to unknown places. I want to go to this next uh, quotation here with Nancy Prince's dialogue with formerly enslaved people in Jamaica, um, because I think it, it goes back also to Fuller's sort of prophecy, her prophetic ideas. Um, here is uh, Nancy Prince uh, comments. Uh, here, surely we see industry, referring to formerly enslaved people. They are enterprising and quick in their perceptions, determined to possess themselves and to possess property besides, and quite able to take care of themselves. They wish to know why I was so inquisitive about them. I told them we had heard in America that you are lazy and that emancipation has been of no benefit to you. I wish to inform myself of the truth respecting you and give a true account on my return. Am I right? More than 200 people were around me listening to what I said. They thanked me heartily. This, this idea of using the present in Jamaica, or although she is writing about this after the fact, so, but using the idea of emancipation was only the first essential step, right? Only the first mm -hmm. essential step mm -hmm. towards self-respect. Um, is this common to use... Uh, travel to imagine new futures. Do you think this happens a lot with travelers? Mm. I think she went to Jamaica because the enslaved people had just been emancipated. And she wanted to refute the argument that formerly enslaved people were lazy and couldn't take care of themselves. But look at that last line. More than 200 people gathered around me and wanted to listen to my questions. Once again, she is establishing herself as a special person with authority. I am going to go back to America and explain this to the people in America. She's trying to envision America after slavery. Unfortunately, she died sometime around 1855, and she never saw the abolition of slavery. 
I link this in the book to her experience in Russia because in both cases she is interpreting a culture that Americans don't know and claiming a respected place in a, in a land where she had never been before. That's the point. So. so do you think this is common to imagine the future when you go or to imagine future possibilities when people travel? I, th I think the, the point about travel, um, do you know the expression, the past is a foreign country, they do things differently there? You go to a foreign country and it's different. It gives you resources to imagine a possible difference within your own country. I don't think most of these travelers went with the idea or came back with the idea that they were going to totally transform their own culture. But I think for both Margaret Fuller and Nancy Prince, and for David Dorr, the, the enslaved man, the experience of being in these other cultures enabled them to imagine a different personal future and a different public future. Yeah, okay. just as it taught them about a different past. But I want to make sure we have time to bring yeah, people yeah, yeah, in absolutely, as well. Absolutely, absolutely. So we can do that now. Why don't we yeah. do that now? Right. That's right. That's right, because when you travel to another place, just as when you study history, this is one of my arguments as well, travel writing is kind of like historical writing. It becomes a process of interpreting a culture to people who have never been there and don't know about it and don't speak that language. You come back with a new knowledge, and that gives you status. It gives you influence. It gives you a social role. I could say in my own, I don't want to be about myself, but when I came back from my journeys years abroad, I became clear that I wanted to be a historian. I hadn't known, I thought I was going to be a lawyer. Can you imagine? The lawyers of this world are important. I had a lot of them in my family. And I said, I don't want to be a lawyer. I came back from my travels and I said, I want to help other people understand the diversity of cultures and people and experiences in the world. So I'm part of this story too. I just don't tell my it's your night, Lloyd. You gotta be in this yeah, story. Okay. I'm so. sorry for telling my story. <laughs> but that's where it all that's where I became sensitive to the way this happens. So in other words, as an historian, you're helping people travel to the past to create their own. I'm a travel writer and yeah. travel interpreter because in every class I ever taught I was engaging with people who had never been there and helping them understand a place and a language and a set of values that were not their own, mm -hmm. which were different, but which on some level were also similar. That's what makes us human beings. We're all different and all similar. And a journey shows you that experience. Why don't we take some more questions from the audience, but I will re repeat your question so the folks online can have it. And, and Paul, let folks know online that they can uh, ask questions as well. Yeah. I Other mean, questions for Lloyd? in our audience. Yes, Betty. The question was, how did you find these people? So this is a, there's a kind of randomness about it, like life itself, right? I, I say in the book, um, it's sort of like I met each of these people while I was traveling somewhere else. You know, like when you're on a trip and you might sit down on an airplane and you start, oh, you're, you know, you start hearing about them. You say, I, I'd like to know more about you. So, um, a couple of things. Victor Jacquemont was a friend of Lafayette. I was writing a book about Lafayette. I found this man, Jacquemont, who went and lived at La Grange, Ch uh, Chateau of Lafayette. And I said, this is amazing. He went to America, then he went to India. He had been injured in a lab accident because he started out with the desire to be a doctor and a scientist, and he ended up being a botanist and a writer. Then there was Flora Tristan, who I was studying the rise of French social movements in the 19th century, and I met her, and she was fascinating. She went to Peru to try to get money from her father's family. I could tell you the whole story. She didn't get it, but she turned herself into a writer. And then Margaret Fuller was the object of a, the subject of a biography by my good friend Charlie Capper, who I used to talk to. We started at UNC the same semester. And we would sit there and drink coffee, and he'd tell me about her. And I said, she's amazing. So I started reading about Margaret Fuller. The same with Randall McGavick. I had studied Southern history years ago, and I met this guy, 
who was from Tennessee, and I thought, amazing, a guy from Tennessee traveled to Europe. I'd like to know more about him. I could go through all of these people. Nicolas Point, who was a Jesuit priest who lived among indigenous people in the Northwest, in what is now Montana and Idaho. And I was studying the rise of uh, secularism in 19th century France, and I came upon this man, Nicolas Point, who was rejected because he was a Jesuit. He fled, he went to America, and he ended up being a missionary. Uh, and he wrote about the, his encounter with Native Americans. Each one of these people, they were fascinating. And most of them, nobody even knows about. It's like if you met somebody, nobody even knows your story. Let me tell your story. I want to introduce you to my friends. Kind of like a big dialogue at a, a salon. I love salons. <laughs> salons where you sit down and share a conversation and somebody tells you, I want to let you know about a friend of mine who I met at a party last week, and you learn about their life because of your relationship to your friend. So I could say each one of these people were interesting to me. I could have written about 10 different people. The other thing I should say, I started teaching a course at UNC. I'm so happy one of my students is here, Fiona, don't be shy, who came from China and was in my class. And with her help and the help of many other students, I talked about some of these writers like Margaret Fuller and David Dore. And they said, this is really interesting. I said, yes, it is. Let's talk more about it. And I a dialogue with my students helped me understand why these people might be interesting to others. By the time Fiona took the class, I was already deep into David Dorr and Margaret Fuller, but it was a dialogue. You remember we just talked about these people? Yeah. Like you might meet a person at a, at a cocktail party. I don't want to foster drinking, let's just say at a religious. Sorry, we don't have wine. Yeah, okay. Chris, uh, question. When are you going to set up a salon for all of us? Well, you Just know, mom. this is a little like a salon itself. We're all sitting here. One of the characters, David Doerr, who I, I became fascinated by, he's kind of obnoxious. He, by modern standards, he's unquestionably a male chauvinist. He has very strange ideas about gender. But he, he tells a story about a dream, sort of like Martin Luther King had a dream. He's in Paris. He dreams that he is welcomed into a, a, a dinner party where everybody is open and friendly to their friends, where there's no hierarchy, where everybody is equal. And he narrates that story. He says, a man can dream with his eyes wide open. And in a way, that's what, to me, a, a salon, but let's not just say a salon, a good conversation is always about letting people dream with their eyes wide open. That's what I loved about that man's story. Yes, yeah. Brian. Some authors make a lot of money writing books and writing. Do they need to use the race self interest to provide them with the income they're writing? The question was uh, Did any of these writers make money off of these travel writings? This is another way in which I identified with them deeply. <laughs> no, they did not. Like a good academic who works hard on a book for years and then it disappears into the never, never land. So three of them died. Um, Margaret Fuller had written all these letters that were published in the New York Tribune and they were later published as a book, but she received, I believe, $10 per article. I mean, nothing. That wouldn't even buy dinner in Italy in the 19th century. Um, Nicolas Point wrote, his, wrote a series of letters and um, journal entries. They were never published until after he died. Um, Victor Jacquemont, who I feel particularly sad about because he was only 31 when he died, he wrote huge voluminous diaries and letters back to France. He died of cholera or dysentery in India when he was 31. He had dreamed of going home and becoming a famous scientist and writer. He never made it. I could give the same story to everybody. Nobody ever made money from these books. You know, Lloyd, an interesting point you just brought up, though, is that all of them died fairly young. 
And it just makes me wonder, one question I'm wondering about this act of self-creation, like at a certain point in your life, is this a better time to be, do because of their young, it was easier for them to be more labile in their own sort of self-creation? So that's another interesting question. When do people set off on long journeys? Here I will also tell my own story. It's much harder to do this if you're 50 years old with three kids and a house and a job. Most journeys started when people were young, in their 20s or 30s. A number of them started at, although uh, Olympo Duard, the woman um, from France, the last one, she was already, um, well, she was born around 1832. She traveled around 18, yeah, she was in her late 30s. They all died young, sort of like rock stars, you know, Jimi Hendrix and Janis Joplin, Jim Morrison. That's not why I got interested in these people. But they were risk takers. You know what I mean? They went to places that put them at risk. They didn't all die on their journeys. Only Margaret Fuller, Victor Jacquemont, and uh, who was the other one who died? Oh, Nicolas Plant died. He never got back to France. But yes, I think travel is something that people are more willing to do when they're young. And of course, we know a lot of old people who well, travel. I was going to say, I think it's interesting when, when a lot of lifelong learners come to our events as uh, engage with a sort of act of self-creation through coming to CPH events, and many of them are traveling as well. So I think there is an, another sort of golden age in which we can be self-reflexive uh, towards the end of our lives to, to create this. I had a question from Eric Johnson over here. Eric. Yeah. The question was, how do you travel in a meaningful way today in the contemporary world? So one thing that makes it easier for older people to travel now is you just go out and get on an airplane and fly to Europe and eight out, right from RDU, in fact. You don't even have to go to New York or Washington. In those days, it took weeks to get to Europe. It took weeks or months to get back. You were totally out of contact with people in your family. Now, you know, people are texting and emailing and sending photos of themselves. Um, so there's been a, a, a critique of travel in recent years. It, you know, carbon footprints, how it affects the environment, how it forces people in other cultures to be inauthentic, to perform for the traveler. Um, and I, I think that is a problem. Everybody who travels, this is another theme of the book, everybody who travels starts with certain expectations about what they're going to see. Nobody ever gets on a trip and says, I've heard nothing about this place. I have no idea where I'm going. They've read books about it. They've seen pictures. So when they go there, they have to see certain things to know it's an authentic experience, right? Like, if you go to Paris and you never saw the Eiffel Tower or Notre Dame or the Champs Elysees, and, and you came home and they said, well, how was the Eiffel Tower? And they said, I never saw it. And you said, well, you went to Paris? There's certain things that are required. But then the idea is, I want to have an experience that isn't a tourist experience. I think that's what you're talking about. These people all envision themselves as travelers. Travel is different from tourism. Tourism is something often people go in a large group, they spend two days in a certain place, they are given a guided tour, the, they, they are sent to this restaurant or that restaurant. They're not going to lose their bags because they just set them outside their hotel room and somebody picks them up. Travel is something that is more independent. You put yourself in unexpected positions. I'll just take my own example. That trip I took from Calcutta to Paris, which was almost three months, two and a half months. We weren't on a tour group. We just had, we would go to a town. We'd find out how to get a bus to the next town. There was no guide. You just got off the bus. You walked into, you look for a little flop house. You know, you think, boy, this is the real deal. This is, I'm not on a travel tour. I'm on a tourist. I'm a traveler. But of course, there is no way to travel without a narrative, without a structure, without a set of expectations. So you can't draw an absolute dichotomy between travel and tourism, but there is a great deal of emphasis on authentic experiences. 
and it's hard to get those in organized tours or they'll take you on a tour and say now we're going to go see authentic Cambodian dancing somebody comes out and dances or I think it's hard to have a travel experience that only lasts a few days or a few weeks. Margaret Fuller talks about this. She criticizes all these Americans who come to Rome and they spend 10 days there and she says they think they know about Rome. They know nothing about Rome. She felt superior to the tourists. Travel writers who live for years on the road always feel superior to tourists. You know that experience? How, how many of you in this room have traveled in a foreign country? Would you raise your hand if you have? Gee, almost. You have all been somewhere, and you've searched for something in that experience that will tell you something about yourself. So you want to be comfortable, but you also want something you hadn't expected to happen to you, right? If it's exactly like at home, why go? Right. That's a great question, Eric. I don't know how you find that. You have to take risks, and you have to put yourself in unfamiliar places. I would even say unknown places. So, Lloyd, you, losing your baggage, not knowing where, getting sick, um, having an accident, breaking your leg. Last time I was in Paris for any time, my poor wife Gwen broke her leg. Ending up in a hospital you've yeah. never been to. That's authentic. You know, I wanted to when I. When we were in, <laughs> when we were living in France, I wanted to learn the French language better, and I said, "I think I need to go to prison," mm -hmm. <laughs> and that'll force me. To this is what happened to James Baldwin. If you ever read *Notes of a Native Son*, one of my favorite travel books, James Baldwin was living in Paris around 1949, and he. He got arrested on the charge that he stole some bed sheets. Oh, it's an amazing story. And he ended up in prison for nine days. It changed his whole understanding of himself and his experience. I think travel imprisonment is a form of travel. It takes you to an <laughs> unknown place. Well, we are we are at I think we have a we are at seven oh four, but I I would love to have if there are any other questions. Lori, is there anything else you wanted to add? One of the people that you wanted I to wanted to just to? say one thing about Olymp Oduard, this woman, who was an early feminist, who went to America, and who said um, she had written this book. It was called uh, about you know the American Far West, and she says here that her writing gives her an identity. See, there is a picture of her. If a man attains a certain fame as a result of his studies and careful work, he immediately seeks to fulfill his ambitions. He can, his, you know, he'll get recognized. All work, therefore, has its reward for a man, but nothing is guaranteed for a woman. In place of encouragement, she only encounters mocking minds that are always ready to deny her ability to diminish whatever merit that she might have. The right to give a body and soul to her thought is challenged, and she is forced to hide it at her risk. So this is the story of women, people like Margaret Fuller and Flora Tristan and Nancy Prince and Olympe Oduard, claiming the right to use their minds and to be respected. And sometimes a woman of color, sometimes a woman who's been rejected because she doesn't fit in. And I was thinking before this, over the last week, you know, we've, we've seen what happened to a woman, to what, ha what happens even in our own time. How do we see ourselves in these people what has changed and what has stayed the same? And travel, which may just seem about escapism and about getting away from home, becomes a way to reflect on what it means to be a woman, what it means to be a man, what it means to be an African-American man, what it means to be an enslaver from Tennessee. It doesn't matter who you are. This is why I wrote about very different people. It doesn't matter who you are or where you go, you will discover something about yourself and your ambitions and your aspirations that you did not know before. And that is why the book is about traveling to unknown places out there and inside. And I hope people will use the book to reflect on their own journeys. Because as they say, life is a journey, not a destination. Is Lloyd. that a cliche? Of course it is. Lloyd, I, I just want to... 
I want to I want to summarize this by saying that everyone in this room have been on many intellectual journeys with you. We've all traveled with your ideas, and I know that every person in this room is a better self because of it. So thank you, Lloyd. Lloyd Kramer, thank you. everybody. And Jonathan Gerard has an OWR. E kid. Divas get roses, troubadours something better. And maybe you're not a troubadour so much as a wanderer. I'm a, tra a wanderer, but a all who wander so are not lost. He's a wanderer. Uh, yeah, yeah. Apologies to Gilbert and Sullivan. Oh, so, so well, think from abroad. Where did this come from? It came from Whole Foods. <laughs> Whole Foods. A place that is unknown to some people. Thank you. I am so honored. Mike, you never see, you never know what comes next. This is why we get up every day. Thank you all for being here. And I hope Lloyd you Kramer, book, everybody. you'll Thank learn you. something about yourself that you never thought about before. Thank Great. you. Thank you.